Okay, I'm calling the Committee of the Whole meeting for Friday, February, Monday, February the 13th, 2017 to order. And I'll begin as usual by asking Councillor Darling, who's uh, filling in for Deputy Mayor Henderson tonight, if there are any additions to the agenda. There are no additions to the agenda this evening. Okay, thank you. Are there any uh, declarations of pecuniary interest from members of Council tonight? Seeing none, Mr. Davey, we can proceed. Your Worship, the first uh, item on the agenda tonight is presentations, and we have a presentation from James Coburn to Coburn Council for his 198th birthday celebrations. Welcome, James. Thank you, Your Worship. Good evening, Council, Your Worship, Directors, CEO Peacock, lovely to see you all tonight. I just wanted to say, for someone who's 198, I feel pretty good for being a dead guy. <laughs> to see 120 kids here this morning from C.R. Gummo, North, uh, Northumberland Christian School, Terry Fox School, Burnham Public School, and the Montessori School, to fill the courtroom with young people, learn a little bit about, a, about Confederation time frame here in Coburg, and what Victorian life would have been like was a fantastic opportunity here this morning. Yes, I know they made a lot of noise up and down the stairs over top of the finance department. <laughs> yes, I know the building maintenance manager may give me grief over the wood shavings that are up and down the, the staircase from the paddle carver we had here this morning in his voyageur costume. But I think the little bit of extra effort on behalf of Victoria Hall staff is well worth a wonderful celebration and our future leaders learn a little, little bit about the history of Confederation and what it means to be a Coburgian and who James Coburn was. I've also had the pleasure as well of introducing these 120 young people to the first speaker of the House of Commons chair, which is on temporary loan from the federal government, arrived Thursday afternoon, was uncrated, put into the room, and this, this, today was its first formal visit from these 120 young people. And it was fantastic to see them, to, to teach them a little bit about Confederation, what a speaker of the House of Commons does, and how important that was that that speaker came from Coburg and what an important piece of history it was with the formation of our wonderful country and how important it is to be Canadian. The chair is on temporary loan until uh, probably the middle of September so it will take uh, I think a, a central place in a number of our celebrations for the 150th uh, anniversary of Confederation this year. Certainly I know I plan on sitting around it, because you can't sit in it, um, obviously. Uh, a wonderful piece of that history uh, uh, is very limited in terms of how much it can be t touched or moved um, uh, as part of those uh, significant events that we've got coming up this year. Uh, things like the Canada Day, Canada Day Week uh, uh, festivities, obviously for uh, Coburn Day, uh, part of the Civic Long Weekend, and other activities. Uh, we're doing a new insert actually to the Coburn Room uh, brochure talking a little bit about the chair so that when folks come to visit this summer whether they be locals or tourists as part of the 12 o'clock uh, tour that the tourism department puts on of Victoria Hall they can learn a little, little bit about the chair as well. Today's birthday celebration was done in partnership with the Coburg Public Library and I specifically want to thank Rhonda Perry for her fantastic work. This never would have got off the ground without her help and support at the library. The Children's Department does great things there and has a wonderful contact list with volunteers who help make today a wonderful event. We had activities on children's uh, uh, toys and games, a, a paddle carver, a, a printer, a tour of the art gallery, and then when we finished here at uh, Victoria Hall, 120 kids walked up King Street and went and did a tour at St. Peter's Church. They had music, their lunch boxes that they brought with them, and a piece of cake. And if you could see this massive slab cake vanish, and there was six pieces that were left to come back to the planning department staff here this afternoon. Which, of course, then they all got ate there. Uh, your Worship... I really want to thank the Cobra Council for their support in supporting uh, Rob Washburn and myself in the role of James Coburn and how wonderful it was to be 198 today. And then if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and, and we as Council want to thank you for everything you and Rob Washburn are doing to 
you know, to, to educate people on the importance of this uh, very historic figure for Coburg. Very important person in Coburg, one of the most important, and obviously being the first speaker of the House is, uh, is a significant uh, kind of accomplishment. So um, I think you inspired them all today. There was, uh, the Victoria Hall was just a buzz with excitement, and I'd like to think it was because of what you were doing, not because they were out of the classroom. And uh, I did get an opportunity to meet with some of them. As a matter of fact, a uh, class from Burnham School asked me if I would pose with them and have their picture taken, which I That's did. Fantastic. And then, of course, uh, they all had little workbooks with them with reference into what some of the things they saw. The, the James Coburn room, the 198th birthday, the uh, the printer, and so on. So uh, I ended up signing, I think about 35 books, and uh, I, well, I felt like I felt like Wayne Gretzky. So, <laughs> so it, Rob, it was uh, an exciting day here in Victoria Hall, and we owe a lot of that uh, to you. So thank you again, and thank I'm you, going Richard. to open up to any any other members of council who'd like to make a comment, uh, Councillor Rowden. Thank you, Worship. Uh, just a quick question there, uh, Robin. Uh, on the chair, you were saying that you can't sit in it. You've got to sit around it. Is there a reason for that? Or I mean, we're proud of what you do and everything, but I'd like to see a picture of you in it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your Worship, the, the federal government was very clear on, on uh, the limitations that we can do with this particular artifact. Um, one of the reasons that they are so particular about it, it is one of the only pieces of furniture that exists from Confederation period from 1867 because at the end of, of James's uh, uh, tenure as Speaker of the House, it was granted to him and he took it home with him basically. So much of the House of Commons was destroyed in the fire of 1916 that there's almost nothing left of Confederation era and so the federal government, in particular the curator of the House of Commons is very uh, uh, particular on, on what pieces went out Fortunately, because of the work that they're doing in Ottawa this year with some construction that the chair was available, and we're so pleased to have it here in Coburg. And again, I would think there'd be a lot of people who would want their picture taken in it, or uh, so that you don't have to really guard it with your life, no doubt. In my as long mind. as they don't mind standing beside it with me, then I would love to have my picture taken with them. <laughs> Councillor McCarthy. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, this is always a, a, a wonderful event that you uh, give context for the school students. Were you by any chance in attendance when they went to the art gallery today, or were you, were you, you did your part and they did their part? Uh, unfortunately, I, I was in the Coburn room, and I was one of the five stations, so every 15 minutes I had a different group of 25 students come through, and I didn't get a chance to see them up, up in the art gallery. Um, I, I know that they went up to learn a little bit about what the, the current uh, uh, exhibition that they have on about uh, uh, the residential schools and what beautiful, uh, uh, vibrant art that the First Nations has as, as, again, part of their history story that is currently being told in the art gallery. And, and that was the point I was going to make is that it's not always that when February 13th comes, the gallery's worth a visit no matter what's in it, but exactly. it just turns out it has a very deep Canadian story that uh, began a few weeks ago. So I'm sure uh, Councillor Sagan will give some feedback in her report ne was next week to see, because th those are big concepts, Speaker of the House, Truth and Reconciliation, what an education. So thank you. Okay. Other comments, questions? Well, again, thank you, uh, Rob, for all, your, all the support you provide us in, in uh, you know, spreading the word about James Colburn. Much appreciated. Thank you, Your Worship. You do an excellent job. Your Worship, our second presentation this evening is from Northumberland County CAO Jennifer Moore and Director of Finance Treasurer Glenn Dees regarding the County 2016 Accomplishments, 2017 Priorities, and Budget Highlights. Welcome, Jennifer. Good evening. As we usually do uh, this evening, we're, uh, we're here to go over some of the highlights of what we did at the county in 2016, as well as talk a little bit about what our plans are for 2017. Uh, we try and get out to each one of our member municipalities at least once a year, uh, and uh, usually about this time, right after uh, budget approval. So uh, we will go through uh, a number of slides uh, and talk about um, again 2016 as well as um, as where we're going so we'll start off as I mentioned I think I've already gone through our our outline uh, a reminder about our strategic plan it was approved uh, in 2015 uh, and it is for the four-year term of council 
Uh, it included our mission and our vision and our core values um, as we move forward. Uh, most importantly, you'll see the four strategic pillars that we have, and that's the way we will speak to all of our accomplishments. As we put together the budget, as we decide on what our direction is each year, we do that in the context of what are our pillars. And if it doesn't fit in one of those pillars, we really look back and we ask ourselves, why are, why are we taking on this initiative? So just as a quick reminder before I get into the details, I'll talk a little bit about um, what we do at, at the county, just as a very, very quick overview and, and hitting on some of the highlights. Uh, you might remember we have over 500 kilometers of arterial roadways. We have over 112 bridges and structures. We operate the Golden Plow Lodge long-term care home here in Coburg. It's 151 beds. We respond to over 20,000 paramedic calls annually, uh, and that volume is going up by about 6% a year. We have a, a 5,500-acre forest. We operate one, one uh, open landfill and three transfer stations. We also monitor six closed landfills. We have a re recycling plant and the waste collections uh, operations. We have our economic development and tourism, including the uh, Business Advisory Center and the Ontario Agri-Food Venture Center. We have POA, so if you get a speeding ticket, we happily take your money. Uh, we operate 344 social housing units as well as over 500 nonprofit units of affordable housing that we fund. We, have the, uh, we operate the Ontario Works Employment Services and Children's Services programs, and then we have all of the support services that uh, help each one of those, those um, programs operate uh, efficiently through the year. So back to the strategic plan, we have our four strategic pillars prosperity, sustainability, community, and excellence. So this slide here, uh, when I'm doing the presentation for staff, we quiz them and ask them if they know what this is. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it, it's from our uh, competition that we had last year from the Prosper in Northumberland, uh, an initiative that was to promote uh, Northumberland, promote business here, uh, and we had a photo contest, and this was one of the, the winning uh, photos, uh, a great shot of the uh, agriculture and rural nature of our community. So as we go through the presentation, there's a combination of some, some photos as, as well as some words. Here you can see the Ontario Agri-Food Venture Centre along the top and some of the activities that are going on there. The facility, as, um, as you'll hear more in a, in a presentation later on this evening, is really helping uh, food entrepreneurs and farmers to create that secondary source of income. This year, uh, as it's got up and running, you, we've seen a wide range of products, from salsa and toothpicks to sweet potato soup and pelletizing hops and ketchup, uh, barbecue sauce, freezing and, and chopping and washing a, an assortment of vegetables and so on. So we're really starting to see uh, activity in that center pick up uh, and it contribute to uh, what our local businesses are able to, to do. Down in the bottom, uh, on the left, you can see our first citizenship, citizenship ceremony uh, took place. It was in uh, Port Hope, and there were 42 individuals um, that were sworn in as new Canadian citizens last year. It was a very exciting event to, to see that. Um, lots of emotion. There was a lady sitting right ahead of me, dressed all in red and white, and she cried throughout the entire ceremony. Uh, she was so proud to become a Canadian. So really nice to be part of that, especially for those of us that were born in Canada and have never um, taken that oath or, or seen others do that. So it was, it was really a, a, a quite, a, quite an, a moving event in, in many ways. Uh, on the bottom right, uh, a big uh, initiative was launched around the E3 program, and this is getting the youth more involved in entrepreneurship and bringing, um, helping to develop their skills. We, we hear a lot about uh, our aging demographic and the outflow of youth, and starting to get them involved in entrepreneurship early on really helps them uh, to see ways that they can come back to the community and come, come home and, and have a great career here. I think I've talked to uh, most, of the, most of the initiatives here on the slide listed under our accomplishments. Uh, again, the Faster Forward program is another initiative through the Business Advisory Centre. Uh, I really focused on our entrepreneurs, uh, looking at ways that we can help them to develop skills, to make their businesses successful, to grow their businesses, and that's where, where we really are seeing the growth and in, in increase in, in jobs here. So uh, a lot of resources go to, to making sure they have the skills that they need to be successful. We have a, a couple of uh, pictures here around sustainability. This is talking mainly about infrastructure. Um, the picture on the top is not a, a big crater. Uh, we didn't have uh, anything land there. It is a, a work that's been going on at the Brighton Landfill. We're just finishing it up now. It is a new cell development 
Um, it's, uh, I won't talk in the engineering terms. They will probably, uh, they, they probably have my head if, if I were to explain it this way to them, but we dig a big hole in the ground and then we line it with plastic and fill it with garbage. Uh, there, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, there's many layers of aggregate and different types of, of materials and textile that, that they lay down to make that successful. But um, basically it is uh, an excavated hole in the ground uh, and the plastic is there to capture the leachate so that we can get all of that material. It actually um, then gets proce processed through the, uh, the sewage treatment plant actually here in Coburg, uh, we have that arrangement made um, so that uh, it's not leaching into the ground like it did with the previous cell, previous parts of the landfill where it was natural attenuation. Um, so we have a couple more cells to build after this one, but um, this, this particular cell is just being finished up now. Uh, on the bottom, uh, a new uh, coal burn emergency services base was built. This is uh, co-locating the coal burn fire department and our EMS base. Um, they have, uh, it's one building, each with their separate garage areas and um, some, mutual, some shared space in the middle for meeting rooms, washroom, locker rooms, that sort of thing, as well as the office space. So you can see a bit of a picture of what it looks like inside as well. Um, fortunately, it was a gray day when we took that picture, but everybody got in there as of January, so construction happened through all of last year. Along the same vein, uh, most of our uh, EMS bases were not appropriate sites when they were downloaded from the province. Uh, around 2001, so we have been slowly um, moving to find uh, sites that, that meet their needs. And as I mentioned, with call volumes going up every year, particularly with the aging population, um, getting them into the right facility is important. So we're working on Rosny Services. We started planning for that um, in uh, 2016, and we hope that we will uh, be uh, under construction uh, in another few months. We did the CNR CPR bridge, which I'm assuming folks here are familiar with that work that lasted all last summer. Uh, that was our largest roads project in 2016. Uh, 139 kilometers of uh, surface treatment. Uh, that was what was done with the county staff. Uh, over 100 kilometers of that was member municipal roads uh, with the balance being county roads. Uh, we rehabilitated, uh, we paved about 12 kilometers of county roads and that's a fairly typical year for us. Uh, when we look at the MRF, we did a, a new line that was implemented in 2015. So by last year, we had everything fine-tuned and were able to get the, um, the final stats on how that was going. With the new material, it was opti an optical sorting line that helped us to divert more materials away from landfill. Uh, everything that we recover, of course, frees up more space at the landfill. It also means that we can get more revenue because we're able to, to sell it. Um, and then you can see here the stat, we were able to uh, divert the equivalent of over 24 million 500 milliliter water bottles. Um, they did a great uh, media launch of that and, and showed what that would look like in some great big bales of plastic. And we also did the Eagleson Landfill Remediation. I think uh, folks here are probably familiar with the Eagleson um, Landfill. It was the former Coburg uh, Landfill site. Uh, in that case, we diverted a creek and, and filled in uh, the old creek bed so that the water was running clean around that site. It um, is now complete. They just got the last of the creek bed filled in uh, in December and January, and most of the, the stream uh, was put through. And you can see here from the pictures what it was like through construction. And now when the water runs through there, uh, it really does look like it's been there forever. We've been working on the design for the Golden Plow Lodge rebuild. Uh, we've mentioned this one in the past. The province is requiring that we rebuild the Golden Plow Lodge and be moved into their, in there prior to January 2025. Um, again, uh, here in town, uh, if you're familiar with where the current Golden Plow Lodge is, there's a great big empty lot next to it, um, looking down towards, uh, towards, towards the town water tower. That's where the new site will be. So we're, we're just, we're showing you the, the lawn right now, but it, it will be uh, a new 151 bed site, the same as what we have today. We also did implemented some new technology when we talk about the real view with paramedic data that's really helping us in our dispatch as well as call analysis and training of staff. We uh, did some uh, consultation around the transportation master plan. That work is now complete with the draft and we hope that it'll be approved in March at uh, the county council meeting. We are working on some behind the scenes stuff. It's not maybe quite as fancy, but asset management software is being implemented and of course vital to continuing to manage our assets effectively. And also some work with the forest around planning with the silviculture plan being approved and significant work on our forest master plan. Um, looking to the future and how we maintain uh, that resource and make sure that um, we are harvesting it uh, responsibly. 
for looking at some of the uh, community-minded uh, initiatives that and accomplishments. Uh, there's two of the, the artist renderings there of a new uh, affordable housing building, which will be on Monroe Street here in Coburg. Um, the successful proponents uh, pr proposed this, this project, and we hope that um, within a, a, a year and a bit, uh, we will have folks living in there. In there. It's uh, 31 units, and it is seniors-focused uh, affordable living. Uh, you can also see that there's a couple other snapshots there from our local government week uh, where again much like we we just heard about the the fun of involving the youth in, in local government and educating them on what we do we also had a lot of work done in 2016 around the 20,000 homes campaign uh, in particular we had our registry week and that was intended to go out into the community and to actually make an attempt to count those that are homeless or at risk of becoming homeless the numbers were actually quite startling we know there are people living in our community that are truly homeless and we know that there are many others that are at risk of becoming homeless we all that data has now been um, tabulated and uh, at wednesday's county council meeting will actually be presented to the public um, so that they can see the the entire picture of what homelessness looks like as well as some recommendations on how we want to start to work on that uh, however, we've already started some of those initiatives around homelessness and poverty reduction strategies, and some of that's coming out of provincial initiatives as well as what uh, the county is doing with our partner agencies. Um, and I think that I think that covers most of most of this slide. These are some pictures here from Registry Week, so you can see that when we went out to the community um, to try and get a better sense of um, where homelessness is. Uh, there was everything from knocking on doors, uh, meetings in churches, meetings where meals were, were supplied, to hot chocolate days and attempting to reach those that were truly um, uh, on the street or out and about in the community. Uh, again, we're also seeing um, some changes largely being driven by the province around the Best Start Network and the Triple P, the Positive Parenting. Those initiatives are all around um, changes that are coming forward in children's services. And they did a lot of work through 2016 on how learning happens and starting to look at redesigning some of those programs that we provide uh, and partner with our various community agencies to do. Uh, and then finally, there's the comment around the Food for All warehouse. We distributed about 1.6 million pounds of food in 2016. Again, it's a good news story that we were distributing a lot. Unfortunately, it also shows that the need in our community continues to, to increase. Uh, a lot of support towards year end with uh, out front of Victoria Hall here. We had um, a live broadcast during quite miserable weather, um, but a nice push at the end of the year to make sure cupboards were full for the Christmas season. Uh, we also have done a fair bit of work and looking at the partnerships and collaboration uh, across uh, the various municipalities in the county. A lot of that focused around emergency response, emergency preparedness, first aid training and CPR training uh, where we're finding that there's opportunities to partner there. Um, we also uh, had our second annual first responders event. This was quite popular and that has to do with recognizing those individuals that participated in saving um, an individual with a cardiac event. Um, it recognizes everyone from the dispatcher, uh, paramedics, fire, and police, anyone who was involved in that call. And uh, we uh, had some, some great uh, news for our paramedics. Seven of our medics were awarded the Governor General's Award uh, in the fall. The picture of the snow plow down there on the bottom is part of our local government week where we took some plows and had a paint the plow event uh, at three local schools and those are the plows that work in their area so the kids after uh, painting them they got to uh, see all winter long with them out and about in their own community. We, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of training was done around uh, emergency preparedness and we also uh, took up some community uh, information events looking at our operational support vehicle we had an ambulance that was being decommissioned and they've outfitted that to do some community outreach uh, and recognizing the importance of letting uh, members of the community particularly the kids see what it's like to be in an ambulance when it's not in a, in a crisis situation uh, a lot of pictures here all the ones in the top are from local government or from take your kids to work day uh, again, uh, a new event for us and an opportunity to get the youth uh, into the county to learn what we do and also to look at some of the careers that are available um, to them. The, the snapshot in the bottom is uh, from a survey that we did on employee engagement and we're very uh, pleased to say that uh, we had some, some great results uh, from the staff 
identified some things that we need to work on, but overall um, it shows just how get dedicated the county, uh, county staff are to, to delivering the services that they do. The Golden Plow Lodge received their CARF accreditation, the Commission on Acc Accreditation of Rehabilitation Facilities. Uh, they were able to do that with um, very uh, strong reviews from the evaluators, um, and it speaks to the quality of the care that's delivered uh, in our long-term care home. Uh, I mentioned the employee and engagement strategy, and we'll continue to build on that through 2017 as we look at some, uh, some initiatives there. Uh, also continuing on with our career development and leadership program, it used to be our succession planning, recognizing that there's a great opportunity to continue to develop uh, our staff and look at, for, look at opportunities for them to, to develop uh, within, in their, uh, within the county in expanded roles. We've also um, started some training and that will continue around developing PTSD prevention strategies. Uh, with the changing legislation and a number of behind the scenes work around looking at computer upgrades, phone systems, and some of the things that have to happen to help facilitate um, all the things that we do. So with that, I will turn it over to Glenn to talk a little bit about 2017 priorities and our long-term financial plan. Uh, Jennifer, just before you uh, finish, can, uh, I'm going to ask any members of council if they have any questions on, okay. on 2016. Uh, I think it's really great that you're here doing this presentation. Uh, although there's not a lot of people in the audience tonight, we are live streaming every <laughs> one of our council meetings, so hopefully there's a number of people watching from home, and I think it's very important that people get educated on all the services the county does provide, because we are under a two-tier system, and it's certainly a lot more efficient for the county pro to provide some of the more expensive services uh, than, than each municipality doing so, so I, I hope it's a, a good education process for council and, and members of the public, and I'm sure that uh, people will get a better appreciation for what some of the costs are and in what the county manages when uh, Glenn makes his presentation and you can see you know the cost of um, waste management for example any uh, so any uh, questions for Jennifer on uh, I'll start with Councillor Rowden thank you uh, your worship and uh, Jennifer thank you for the presentation I just wanted to uh, publicly thank you for uh, the county itself for supplying us with a snowplow <laughs> and I know the people out there wondering why the county snow plows driving around covered, but I have to explain it every day almost, <laughs> and it's, it's very thankful to be able to have that when our when our trucks are down, uh, especially when they had a lot of smoke damage. So appreciate it's, it. it. It's it's nice to see the the way that the municipalities do help each other out. That that mutual aid is is always nice. Other uh, councillors again and. and There it goes. Um, two questions. One on the Golden Plow Lodge, a lodge, lodge sorry. Um, 151 units, you're basically replacing them with the same number that it was in the current facility. What kind of t uh, waiting time do seniors have to wait to, to get in there? Is it a long list or? Uh, I'm not sure of the length of time at the moment. We are running, um, typically there's 70, 80-ish um, folks on that list. That, that goes up and down. It, it really does depend on um, the need in the community and what's going on. But it's the Community Care Access Center that determines um, okay. the admissions. So we really don't manage um, the list. We're, we're simply given the names of those that are, are next on the list to come into our facility. So um, they, they are the ones that would, mat that would monitor length of time uh, on a wait list. Good. Second question, um, at landfill, um, any of us that have ever bought a computer and all that big styrofoam that comes with it, is there any, um, I guess, source for recycling that? Or is it, I know that's a question that's it's just such huge amounts of, of fill that go in there, garbage, mm -hmm. basically. Styrofoam is a big challenge. <laughs> There's been a lot of discussions on styrofoam. Uh, there's not many places that will actually take it and, and turn it into something. So we have limited opportunities to sell it. Um, we also have challenges with quality control. So even where there is an opportunity to sell it, um, it needs to be very clean. So there's many types of styrofoam um, that residents would like to dispose of, particularly around food waste and that sort of thing, where we simply can't take it because there's no market at all for that. So, we, so to separate it is a challenge, and we can't really do pickup of the bulky styrofoam. 
We do have a limited program for some of the commercial styrofoam, but that's very limited. Um, also, it's not very economical, to be frank, that um, styrofoam is very big and bulky, and to pay trucks to ship that places mm -hmm. for what you can get in value on the recycling market, um, it, it's hard to, to deal with that. So uh, styrofoam continues to be a challenge to look at exactly how we treat that. Um, they're, they're, it is very limited and very difficult. Some municipalities attempt to, to do something with it, um, but it is, it's very, very hard and very limited places that it can go. There is not many manufacturers that actually can work um, recycled styrofoam into their processes. It's too bad, really, because they can squinch up tires and find another use for rubber, but you know they never have seemed to find anything for... So some of the things that we're doing though is there's we're currently working on a design in 2017 for community recycling uh, stations so our transfer stations are going to evolve so okay. there's going to be a lot more bins there's going to be a lot more opportunity to recycle there so while it might not get to styrofoam there's a lot of things that currently we're landfilling uh, that we can have some opportunities to to recycle so uh, in 2016 we started accepting bulky plastics so your lawn chairs and kids toys and all those kinds of odd shaped things that you can't put at the curb we now take those and there is a is a market there are people that can can process those so we're starting to accept them we're doing an evaluation right now of mattresses uh, and looking at the ability to recycle mattresses so uh, and the list goes on so staff are con continually monitoring what there's a market for and what we're able to do something with uh, when we can it can can send it out there uh, and it's a balance. Some things like a mattress, it's not necessarily um, a cost advantage, but it's so large and bulky that if we can keep it out of the landfill, we, we manage to divert a substantial amount of space. So they, they do that evaluation for all different types of products on an ongoing basis. And as we expand the transfer stations into more of a recycling center, then that will have the opportunity for you to go in and put your things into multiple different bins uh, and and try and divert that. It'll also be an opportunity to have year-round household hazardous waste and e-waste collection, which right now we can only do during the warmer months because we don't have any heated facilities. Mm. So we're working on some Thank things. You. We might not get styrofoam, but we, <laughs> we've got lots of. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor McCarthy, you are next, and then Councilor Darling. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you. Love the topic of waste and long-term <laughs> care. <laughs> Top of my list. Um, I ask this every year, and I'm going to ask it again. Are you still on target to begin the wet stream in, I think it was 2019? It is, and actually we're starting planning for that this year. Uh, we anticipate the evaluation of sites and approvals to take uh, about a year or so. Uh, we do need a certificate of approval to, to accept that. Uh, we're looking at... Um, basically Brighton or the MRF to see which one is the most appropriate site and those are properties we own today. Uh, following that we'll have to construct the, the building which probably won't be an elaborate building but we have to do this inside uh, and then our, our waste contract will expire around 2019 and that's when we would have the appropriate truck, trucking facilities to be able to collect it and, and, and manage it. Good to hear. And the other one uh, about Golden Plow, uh, another um, initiative that I believe you got funding for, which is very helpful with what's going on in long-term care, the incidence of dementia, is you, you have funding now for behavioral support nurse. Yes. And um, you're right, the quality of care at Golden Plow is wonderful, but this helps staff problem solve behaviors that can interfere with quality of life, which I'm really thrilled, and because of your beds. But that's the other thing, people often think, well, it's an old home. The quality of care is excellent. That's what matters, the relationship. So I was really pleased. And I believe that staffing members starting soon are already started? I know they were working on it. I'm not sure if they've started yet, but I, I know Claire has been working on, on getting that individual in place. Okay. Councillor Darling, you're next. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, again, I just wanted to congratulate you on the MRF. Uh, I think it's fantastic. I love this stuff that helps the environment. And I was going to ask the same question that Councillor McCarthy asked because uh, I'm really interested in to see when uh, the wet composting is done, but it's not too far off. Good. Thank you. All right. Uh, so thank you, Jennifer, for the, uh, for the update. Uh, oh, oh. Councillor Burkett. Sorry, I missed you. No problem. Um, it's great to see all, this, all the accomplishments. I have been in a lot of these facilities doing work, um, so I've seen kind of behind the scenes that most <laughs> people don't get to see. Um, as for the MRF and the um, 
uh, emergency basis, do you guys ever give tours to the public or to see what's going on and how often do you do those kind of things? The MRF has an open house annually and it coincides with the uh, the week where we do all the big cleanup and everything. We always culminate that, that week with uh, a big barbecue for the community uh, and we open up the MRF and we do tours and we also bring a whole bunch of our, our roads equipment and our paramount uh, and ambulance and, uh, and we do a, a nice event for the community to come out and, and learn about all those different things. So that happens every April. Uh, the paramedic bases we don't typically open up, uh, however with the new facility in Colburn, uh, we've said that once we get uh, the landscaping and, and that sort of, of stuff in, in place, um, probably towards the end of May when it's a little bit better weather, we will open that facility up to the community for a tour of the new facility. Thank you, that's great. Okay, thank you, thank you Jennifer. Now we'll turn it over to Glenn. Glenn, you're getting to be an old hand at this now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So welcome and uh, go ahead with your financial presentation. All right, well, uh, good evening everybody. This is uh, another uh, picture from our Prosper in uh, Northumberland photo contest as well. So we certainly had some, some excellent photos that were, were submitted. So I'll, uh, I'll touch on a, a few items, uh, primarily on our, our long-term uh, financial uh, model as well as our, our current year uh, budget and some of the, uh, the items that we have specifically identified within the 2017 budget. So over the past few years, the county's adopted a long-term financial planning framework. And primarily, this is a, a tool that we utilize so that when we provide financial information to, to council for making strategic, uh, de strategic decisions, they're not looking at the current year budget in isolation. So entering into the 2017 budget cycle, we're presenting the 2017 budget but we're also presenting a detailed plan for, for going out a further nine years. So in effect, they're, they're looking at a 10-year model. Uh, and primarily, this is to ensure that, that decisions are, are you know, more on the longer-term focus and rec recognizing long-term needs as well as our short-term needs. So we do have some core uh, principles that, that drive this framework, and I'll, I'll go through those quickly in, in the next slide. But uh, primarily, when we look at our, our, our long-term financial planning framework, we're, we're trying to ensure that we're also aligned with all the, uh, all the decisions that have been made uh, that focus on the long term. So we look primarily at our strategic plan, and then we also look at some of our, our master plans that have been adopted by council or are about to be adopted. So we look at our transportation master plan, our long-term uh, waste management master plan, our forest silver cultural plan. These are all plans that have major capital items and initiatives identified within them going out over the long term, so we make sure that all gets captured uh, within our model. As I mentioned, it is a 10-year model that we look at, so we always have a uh, current year uh, budget and go out a further nine, and it is a living document that we annual annually update. So every year as we enter into a new budgetary cycle, we add a another year onto that, that horizon. So looking at uh, some of the, the principles that, 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 pr that drive our, our uh, long-term financial planning framework, uh, the, the key one is, is our strategic plan, and you can see the, the pillars of our strategic plan here. So certainly when we, we look at uh, sustainability, we're, we're talking in our model about ensuring we have uh, sufficient infrastructure in place over the long-term horizon. We're looking at uh, prosperity, so this is our uh, ability to develop assets uh, such that we support an environment for thriving individuals and businesses. We look at community and we're ensuring accessibility, uh, things such as our, our local housing corporation and, and ensuring we have affordable, uh, efficient, uh, uh, affordable housing in place. And uh, at excellence, ensuring that we meet all our, our service level requirements under our strategic plan. So uh, either we're, we're meeting our, our service level objectives or, or hopefully in some instances, instances exceeding them as well. Uh, looking at uh, flexibility, uh, really, uh, within the model, that's one of the, one of the key principles, uh, ensuring that over the long term we have flexibility within the model so that we have financial resources going out into the long term. So an example of that is, is looking at our reserves so that we can finance uh, some of our capital projects utilizing specific reserves and then hopefully uh, limit the amount of debt that we, that we have to take on. Uh, efficiency, our ability to use funds in ways that provide high levels of service with maximization of efficiencies. Uh, sufficiency, our ability to ensure sufficient resources for service delivery. Uh, transparency, this really is, is a key, key one under our, our framework. And uh, providing that level of detail in, in a 10-year model really does help with, with public uh, transparency. And obviously, uh, risk management, uh, when, you, when you have a detailed 10-year plan, 
you are able to identify areas where there are potential risks and, and hopefully be able to mitigate them as much as possible. So uh, at the start of our uh, budgetary uh, process and, and under our long-term financial planning framework, uh, we, we set a, a target levy uh, increase to, to work with. So this is, uh, uh, we enter the budgetary cycle uh, looking at a target for not only the, the current year budget, but we also embed it within our long-term plan. So we, we go to council for, for their direction as, as to what uh, would be a, a reasonable target levy increase to look at. Uh, we, we measure this against various indices, so we look at the consumer price index as one measure, uh, but we know that is really a representative of a household basket of goods, which in, in a lot of instances isn't really indicative of the way municipalities spend money, particularly uh, 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 municipalities who provide uh, many capital intensive uh, services. So we also look at the non-residential building construction index as well when we, we try to establish uh, a, a, a targeted levy rate increase. Uh, in, uh, for this year, and in, in our long-term model, it was set at 2%, and Council also approved uh, the second year uh, for uh, an annual dedicated infrastructure levy, and that target was set at 1% of our 2016 capital. So that, that can garner some uh, confusion when people hear that. It's not a 1% increase on our levy. It's really a calculation based on 1% of what we spent in capital in the prior year. Uh, in our long-term model, uh, recognizing our infrastructure needs, uh, we have that set uh, to increase by a half a percentage point in, in each year of our long-term plan as well. So a little more on the, the, the dedicated infrastructure levy. It did, it did commence in uh, 2016 and it is now embedded in our long-term model going forward. Uh, based on the 1% calculation, uh, uh, we actually uh, came in for 2017 at 233,000, which is higher than, than the 1%. So included in that 233,000 for our dedicated infrastructure levy is uh, 48,000 coming out of, of, of base levy dollars that were reassigned. So our target levy increase was 2%. We came in at uh, 1.9. So staff's recommendation to council was to take the 10 basis point differential between the two and the 1.9 and allocate that as well into the dedicated infrastructure levy, which brought us to 233,000 uh, in total. And the dedicated infrastructure levy does get allocated into, uh, into a bridge reserve, recognizing some of our, our larger uh, infrastructure needs uh, for bridges in, in, the, uh, in the horizon. And just to give a little bit of context, you can see uh, the dedicated infrastructure levy over a, a four year period. Uh, in our model, it is, it is actually embedded in for 10, but we're just showing you some numbers here. Even though we have a half percentage point escalation, as I mentioned, it's, it's based on 1% of the prior year capital, so it, not in all years it, it won't go up because it, it is relative to that capital spending. So looking forward, uh, it, within our 10-year our uh, model, we are primarily trying to ensure that we're, we're uh, addressing some of the long-term uh, challenges, particularly around infrastructure. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, having flexibility within our, our financial model, so uh, building reserves so that we have the financial resources to, to be able to, to finance these projects, uh, and also, uh, again, developing master plans and strategic plans that get embedded with it within the model, and focusing on, on collaboration as well where we can. So a perfect example is, is what Jennifer was speaking to with the uh, Crimey Shared Emergency Base, where the county has in-house uh, expertise from a, a project management construction perspective, we're able to, to manage, uh, manage that process and there's certainly economies of scale uh, for a project uh, that size uh, for construction and then also for ongoing uh, operation of the facility as well. So uh, this, this really displays our, our infrastructure uh, deficit. We, we show this uh, uh, each year. Uh, the image on the, the left, the, the blue bars that are um, above the zero line, represent the amount that we're underspending on infrastructure in our long-term model. Um, so our asset management plan uh, indicates we should be spending just over $27 million uh, annually on average, and, and we are uh, spending uh, less than that, and, and that's what the blue bars uh, represent above that zero line. The one anomaly that, that really does stand out is, is 2021, and that year we actually spend more than what the asset management plan would indicate, and that's, that's because that's the year we rebuild the Golden Plow Lodge facility. Again, 2025, a little bit of a, a blip going the other way, and that's the Trent River uh, crossing in Campbellford where we, we build a new bridge uh, in, in Campbellford. 
The image on the right, really the same information again, just uh, just, just show, shown in a different light. The red bars represent the average amount that we should be spending, so that 27.4, and the blue bars represent the amounts that we, we, anticip we anticipate spending in, in each of the, those years. Again, 2021 and 2025 being the anomaly years that, that stand out with those significant capital projects. The other, the other thing that we look at in our, our long-term financial planning framework is ensuring that our, our levy increases are consistent uh, and modest over a long period of time. So th this image really displays some of the challenges the, the county had in the late 90s, where you can see in some years there were actually instances where our levy was, was decreasing uh, and then trying to substantially gain ground in the early 2000s with, 2000s with some sig significant levy increases. So our model addresses consistency. That, that's a primary uh, concern. You can see over the past six years where we've been on target with our levy increases for, for what at the time was 2.5%. Uh, 2017, uh, we reduced it to, to 2%, and you'll see that where that dip occurs and how in our long-term model the green line represents where we're really uh, aligned with that, that target increase. It does uh, uh, deviate up slightly up in some years, and that's really relative to, to the amount that's coming out of the dedicated infrastructure levy uh, in each year. So when we look at uh, our, our flexibility, uh, primarily we're looking at our ability to have uh, reserves towards financing capital projects, uh, as well as, as what, what we have uh, for capacity for taking on debt. The image at the top left uh, shows our, our reserves, and you can see they, they have been increasing, and they, and they do continue to increase in our, our model. This is as we build reserves for specific uh, capital projects, such as the Golden Plow Lodge and the Trent River Crossing, as well as trying to build uh, reserves where we need them for uh, contingencies and any unplanned or extraordinary events that, that, that can occur. Uh, conversely, the bottom right, we're, we're looking at debt. So this is showing our, our debt service costs, so the amount that we have to pay out annually uh, towards servicing our debt. The blue portion of the bars is principal, and the red portion of the bars represents what we would pay out in, in interest. The green bar at the, the top represents the annual repayment limit. This is set for all municipalities by the Ministry of uh, Municipal Affairs. We are well below that limit, and, and certainly, and I, I mentioned this last year, uh, any municipality that was encroaching anywhere close to that limit would really be in dire straits uh, going out and, and looking into their, their, their future financial model. Their hands would, would really be, be tied as far as uh, no capacity for debt and likely in many instances where reserves have been uh, depleted as well. Again, a slight anomaly here where you see our reserves go down in 2021. That's uh, relative to the Golden Plow Lodge rebuild. That's a $40 million project we're anticipating, so $10 million will come out of a dedicated reserve to build that facility, uh, and the remaining funds uh, for financing the $30 million will come from debt. So you can see in 2022, in the subsequent year, where we start taking on those debt service uh, costs as well. So a combination of, of debt and reserves towards financing that. Uh, one other quick comment on uh, uh, financial flexibility. Uh, last year, the county built up our WSIB excess uh, indemnity uh, reserve to such a point that we, we match the requirements of an actuarial report. So as a result of that, we were, we were able to, to self-insure. We have uh, financial resources if there was a catastrophic uh, type WSIB claim. So that resulted in, in savings of, of $100,000 annually by, by having those financial resources uh, in place. So looking beyond 2017, this is just to give uh, some highlights into to some of the items that we have uh, in our 10-year model, uh, well, well in excess of $100 million, really. I'll just touch on a few. Our, our roads and, and bridges construction uh, uh, program, that, that is an annual uh, occurrence between $9 and $10 million each year. Uh, Jennifer touched on the Brighton landfill expansion. That, that really has been a three-year uh, multi-year project started in, in 2016. Uh, for 9.8 million, we'll be spending three and a half million in 2017, and then a further uh, three and a half million in, in 2018. So this year we'll be moving historic waste uh, from an older portion of the landfill into the newly lined cell, and then we'll commence works to start lining the older portion of, of the landfill uh, as well. Uh, the MRF upgrade, so a two two stream recycling system. Uh, our, our composting uh, program, that, that came up, so uh, we have funds set aside for that to come online 2019. Uh, the Rosaneath uh, Ambulance Station, another uh, example of, of, 
a shared initiative with fire and paramedics being housed uh, in the same uh, facility. Highland Drive remediation, that, that's a $5 million uh, landfill remediation uh, in Port Hope, uh, GPL we mentioned, and uh, a waste environmental assessment that will commence this year, about $1.5 million just to do the environmental assessment alone and could, it could take up to, uh, to five years. Uh, so quickly, some of the priorities are capital items that we have identified in 2017. Uh, the Roads and Bridges uh, program, again, uh, that, that's about $10 million for this year. The Rose and East Shared Services Base, the Brighton Landfill we've discussed. Uh, the GPL, even though construction is, is a ways off, there's a lot of planning and, and requirements that need to be facilitated uh, ahead of construction. Uh, and asset management uh, software is being implemented this year so that we can better manage our assets and, and, and ensure that we have a, a living asset uh, management plan, a living document that we, we can provide uh, to the various ministries as, as funding uh, becomes available. And of course, annual equipment, uh, fleet replacement out of our transportation waste paramedics department, our uh, local housing corporation, and various uh, corporate uh, uh, facilities, uh, repairs and maintenance and capital type projects as well. So every year we like to show where construction uh, works are going to take uh, place on the county road uh, network to give some, some visibility to that for, for roads and bridges. And in this year a, lo a lot of the work will take uh, place primarily on, uh, on county road two. So just to highlight quickly on the actual 2017 budget, the levy increase came in at 2.21%. That's comprised of that base levy increase of one9 uh, the dedicated infrastructure levy adds 0.31 to bring us to a total of 2.2 uh, 2.21 sorry after growth. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, the 1.9 is is less than the target that we had of 2%, and those uh, that 10 basis point differential was allocated into the dedicated infrastructure levy. Growth according to impact is 1.36%, and that brings our total levy to 52.3 million, which is approximately half of the county's uh, revenue sources. So quickly on transparency and then our, our, our uh, budgetary control framework, uh, what we like to say is our budgetary process is continuous. Now that council has uh, approved our, our budget, that really becomes the basis for ongoing uh, reporting and ensuring we have transparency. Uh, we do provide for quarterly reporting to, to Council on how our revenues and expenditures are, are tracking relative to the budget, highlighting any uh, uh, challenges or opportunities as they, they come to light. On a, on a quarterly basis, we identify where we have uh, variances related to timing or any, uh, any items that we would consider non-timing or permanent uh, in nature. We also do provide for an annual report. That's the image uh, from 2015 on the right. It's an excellent, an excellent tool for, for transparency for the, the public, showing our financial due diligence. Uh, as soon as we have our 2016 audited financial statements, we will uh, commence works and publish a 2016 annual report as well. So it's, it's, it's also an excellent public education tool for the public as it does discuss all our, our, all our services and what some of the challenges are that, that we've uh, encapsulated within our model uh, for a long term. Uh, just a, a quick uh, uh, image at the bottom right. Uh, financial plan video. This is uh, an another excellent source of, of education for the public. It does, uh, in a very fa fairly simplistic way, uh, describe how our long-term financial planning frameworks framework works, how, how we budget, uh, uh, the services that we provide, and that that's uh, you know one of the sources of education to to the public. And of course, all our detailed budget documents are also uh, available on the, the county uh, website as well. So with that, I can open it up for questions. Well, well thank you, Glenn. Uh, another excellent presentation. I do believe it's important that you know the public knows that there is a, a financial plan in place, and it uh, it, it assures some sort of uh, you know some sustainability, and uh, and we continue to provide services as well as invest in our infrastructure and capital as is required. So very very important for people to know that. Uh, so I'm going to open up to members of council who may have some questions, and I'll start with Councillor Darling. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, just a quick explanation here. I've been always taught that it's not good to pay interest. Um, when you have a, I think on page 31, it's projected to 60 million or somewhere near there in, a, in your reserves, yet you're paying uh, interest. Rather than pay that interest, if you've used your reserves and still paid the interest but paid it to yourself 
quick explanation as to why. I mean, I just like to try and understand that a little better. Uh, some of it's a bit of a, a balancing act. So it's, it's very common for municipalities to use a mix of reserves and debt for, for larger capital projects, particularly ones that are going to, uh, to last a, a long time. So those sort of extraordinary type ones, such as the uh, Golden Plow Lodge rebuild and the Trent River crossing, you certainly wouldn't want to use your uh, uh, reserves for just regular fleet maintenance. But, but that is a good practice. And uh, Infrastructure Ontario actually provides very uh, beneficial rates for municipalities as well. And in a lot of cases, it's also uh, somewhat strategic I in nature. So, uh, for example, our, our paramedic spaces, 50% uh, of, of, of our funding comes from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. So some of that interest would be covered for uh, fr from the ministry. So it, it is it is strategic, and we and we do have to recognize that, you know, not only do we uh, we have to have reserves in place for capital projects, but we also need uh, reserves for some of those contingencies as well. So it is it is a bit of a, a, a balancing act. But but our our debt uh, service costs are are relatively light compared to what a lot of municipalities would. Do. Yeah, I can see that, and I know a lot of a lot of people ask why why we're paying interest when we have money in reserves. A lot of people find it very difficult. And I just wanted a bit of an explanation there as to that uh, it is a strategic plan and yeah. the interest rates from infrastructure in Ontario are quite low. They are very good. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Councillor McCarthy. Thank you, Mayor Bruckner, and thank you. Um, I'm thinking back to the point made that the um, needs for emergency response by your paramedics are increasing about 6% each year, and that's somewhat related to the senior demographic. So when I look at your 10-year um, projects, and this year Colburn, then Roseneath, Trent Hills, and Brighton ambulance stations, is it that you're actually adding staff when you build these facilities to meet the growing demand, or are the staff spread out um, in those communities? There typically isn't staff added. So that we, we look at new shifts when, when we would add some staff. So uh, in these cases, it's strictly capital and infrastructure related. Uh, for the most part, what happened is when the province downloaded the service, we were often in uh, rented spaces or spaces where we were co-located. Uh, so for example, in Colburn, we were in the fire station. We had one ambulance parked inside, but they only were able to give us one bay to park an ambulance in. So that meant that a second ambulance, because if we have 24 hour shifts, we need an ambulance available when the second shift comes in, in case the first shift is out on a call. So leaving an ambulance outside plugged in isn't exactly, uh, it, it's not ideal because that ambulance needs to stay at a certain temperature, otherwise the medications and things on board will freeze. So um, in, in most of these cases, we simply don't have appropriate infrastructure to park our, our equipment in. Um, and we have an added shifts uh, equivalently. It's been a couple of years since we've added a new sh an additional shift. Um, we are appropriately staffed. It's mainly getting all of our equipment inside where it needs to be. Okay, uh, Councillor Sagan. Uh, Glenn, this is for you. Um, you mentioned, uh, I was looking at your graph and what happened in the late 90s, and with the possibility of a change in government provincially next year, um, do you anticipate any similar types of um, downloading for social services and affordable housing or have you have you talked to any of our um, provincial representatives um, there won't be further downloads Ontario works is being uploaded back to the they province. have been I'm just yeah. hoping for not a reversal of what's no. happened for the well, last 10 no, years that's a little hard to predict but I, I, I don't think so and we certainly don't the only thing we've embedded in, in our model is the upload of court security costs okay. and the Ontario works program yeah. thank you Any other questions for Glenn or Jennifer? Seeing none, then again, thank you very much, both of you, for your presentations and uh, very valuable information for us and, and the public. Thank you. Your Worship, the next presentation this evening is again from Jennifer and also Economic and Development and Tourism Director Dan Borwick from Northumberland County with the draft Integrated Economic Development Master Plan. Welcome, Dan. Economic development is a, a, a very hot topic. I know that there are many, many people, not just council, but many members of the public that are interested in economic development and tourism. So I think, uh, this, well, again, this is a great opportunity for you to tell people what, you know, what the county is doing in this field. 
Well, thank you, and uh, to Council, thank you for the opportunity. Um, uh, the slide presentation should give you some oversight or some indication as to what, what the master plan is all about. Um, I'll get that. Um, just some background. Uh, important to keep in context that this is an, an integrated economic development master plan, and, and what's meant by that, it's one that is intended to bolster the local economy, ensures the community's continued vibrancy. The symbolism that we chose to, 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 to try and illustrate how this plan might work is the Anukshuk, and it graces the cover of this document primarily because it demonstrates the requisite stability where strength and balance reside on the interconnectedness of its, of its parts. And as, as we go through this presentation, I'll try and give you some indication as to how integrated uh, economic development currently, currently is. Just as a bit of background in terms of operating environment, what you see in front of you are the latest growth projections provided by the Ministry of Finance for the province. And you'll, you'll note that uh, they've given uh, an indication as to what the projected population growth will be through uh, the various counties. Um, we'll, if we can concentrate on, on southern Ontario, the darkest blue which you see there, which is uh, an over 40% uh, growth, uh, uh, adjacent to it uh, is, is Northumberland, and Northumberland is indicated as one of those counties that has a projected growth of somewhere between uh, fif 15 and, and 40%. Uh, the latest census figures, which were released um, last uh, Wednesday, indicated that Northumberland's growth over the last five years has been just uh, a little over 5% five per five in terms of population growth. So based on, uh, on these projections, which uh, are stretched out over the next 20, 24 years, you're probably looking at a, a population base that's uh, w well over, well over 100,000 people. And I guess one of the points to take from this is that population growth will cer certainly not only be the seniors' growth in the, in the area, but based on a number of other indicators that would indicate that would that would suggest that with the completion of highway 407 with Northumberland being primarily a gateway into into eastern Ontario and the the sort of fullness of growth that exists both uh, north and west of Toronto would become p potentially the next the next logical choice for um, uh, economic and community investment if um, if we take that into consideration, one of the things we tried to do in, in shaping this particular integrated strategy was to try and put some success criteria around what, what, uh, what, what are the major success criteria that would, would, would drive an integrated plan. And there are, are, as you can see, there are a list of about eight items here. Um, these eight, eight items include a, uh, a focused and robust sense of entrepreneurship or can-do attitude. Um, and most importantly, what comes from that is trying to create the right environment which supports that. In, in order to make that work, uh, research and policy engagement, especially uh, anticipating and understanding goals, becomes a critical feature. One of the successes of the department to date has always been that in any of the initiatives that we've undertaken, we've always used research to impact policy. If you impact policy, policy creates programs and ultimately the programs that are created result in dollars. And so that, that approach has been sort of a mainstay in, in, in not only how this plan has been shaped, but if you take a historical look at some of the activities that Northumberland is engaged in, whether it's been um, uh, rural internet uh, activity based on the first broadband, ga broadband gap analysis, which led to the current EORN structure, to, um, to the formation of the Eastern Ontario Development Program, and, and, and subsequently the formation of the Provincial Eastern Ontario Development Fund, all of that was based on research which supported a, 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 an adjustment to policy. When we talk about flexible social infrastructure and supporting physical and emotional needs, what we're talking about here is the fact that essentially everyone and everyone in this room in one form or another is in economic development, whether it's um, the public sector, the private sector, whether it's the faith community, whether it's the service clubs, we're all indicative of the type of community we want and the type of, 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 of cooperation that exists between those various groups drives the economic development agenda. When we talk about resilient economic activity for dollars and goods and services, what we hope to obtain there is the building up of both human and social capital, which sets the tone for community as a whole. We've all, we all realize that a skilled and diverse workforce is, the, is essential in order to, to attract um, 
investment in community. What that means in this era is that productivity, it, we take productivity over increased number of jobs. You'll find for those existing manufacturers that are currently housed in Coburg or throughout Northumberland County, the increase in productivity is not related to an increase in jobs, but rather it's reversed. We become more and more productive, more and more innovative, and more and more lean, which results in more less jobs, but essentially jobs that re represent a more higher skill factor or a higher pay factor. When we talk about connective infrastructure and services for day-to-day -day living, it's, uh, it's very much about the support within an economic development plan that, um, that um, uh, continues to support public amenities and the renewal of communities as, 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 as we go forward. Livability and quality of life, believe it or not, is one of the main qualities that uh, uh, attract individuals to a location like Northumberland. The amenities that we have, the livability, the actual quality of life goes beyond just the senior citizen element but it has a significant impact on trying to attract new business and the type of lifestyle we offer. And finally, the very last point, sometimes it's just serendipity that all of this happens. Things do eventually come together when you need it to. And if you live by a vision, as it was, which is the county vision, of bringing together people, partnerships, and possibilities for a strong and vibrant Northumberland, you have to have a little faith in serendipity. Uh, the Ontario Agri-Food Venture Centre is probably a good illustrator of that. You know, as we began the, the, the work that led to that, it was very, very timely that both the, the, the province in particular had decided to make a significant investment in the local food fund and, and, at, and, 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 and suggest that local food will be a mainstay. So how did we come to put this uh, particular master plan together? Well, a significant amount of supporting research has taken place. Uh, we did uh, um, community stakeholder engagement. These community stakeholder sessions uh, exist, uh, consisted of six sessions, one for each of the portfolios within the department, which drew some 100 participants. And more importantly, over the course of the last three to four years, a significant number of research backgrounders were in place. Um, some of you will remember the Premier Ranked Tourism Destination Project, which uh, came out in 2009, which was an extensive research project taken over an 18-month period to determine tourism resource and tourism uh, uh, growth opportunities. The regional local food uh, business uh, retention and expansion project was uh, ended up being the largest one undertaken by the province, uh, uh, led by Northumberland. That project in, in unto itself provided the background for the building of the Ontario Agri-Food Venture Centre. The Northumberland Employment Land Study was the precursor of the Northumberland County Official Plan and of the Northumberland Immigration Portal became a, uh, a key element in terms of trying to create not only diversity in Northumberland, but by the same token create an opportunity to attract new Canadians, both as, as, as employees and potential employers. So structure. Um, currently, the department, the, the department has become a, a very much a strategically uh, integrated collection of portfolios focusing on a, on a number of sectors, services and projects with county-wide implications. And under its current umbrella, economic development consists of land use planning and inspection services, business immigration, small business and entrepreneurship, tourism, both not only in the form of marketing, but in tourism development and investment, agriculture and food, and manufacturing attraction and retention. So with each and every one of those, the, the intended outcomes are uh, goals uh, for each one of those portfolios is evident within the, the larger report itself. The intended outcome of this activity over the long run is, is certainly to create economic growth and vital vitality, to spur business employment, business and employment growth through increased not only domestic investment but foreign investment, to generate wealth and prosperity, to strengthen quality of life, and to increase, most importantly, assessment and tax revenue. To create a positive business climate and business experiences, to create positive business profile and county image as an investment location and most importantly throughout all the intended incomes is some way to monitor and measure the economic performance and results so that the resident and taxpayer recognizes that what they are doing by contributing to economic development has some return. So the key performance indicators to, to try and determine uh, these outcomes as measurable items, consideration will be given to Northumberland's overall economic growth, employment and tourism numbers, new employers moving to Northumberland, the number of residents living and working in Northumberland, increased, uh, increases in the non-residential tax base, 
um, in particular because agriculture and agri-food is such a large component, the number of people working in agri-food businesses, and foreign investment leads and prospects, of which there are a considerable number at this point in time. And supported by the master plan is support for business attraction, retention, and expansion, and to attract not only uh, industrial and commercial, but also institutional investment to support the startup and growth of small businesses. And as a, as a, just maybe as a numeric indicator, last year the Business Advisory Center of Northumberland um, entertained nearly 1,700 inquiries, followed by some 400 consultations of individuals looking to become entrepreneurs within Northumberland. In fact, it has broadened its suite now to also include the Ontario Agri-Food Venture Center, where food entrepreneurs are becoming a con considerable component of that. Um, that entrepreneurship also in turn fosters research, commerci commercialization and innovation, which builds a great number of our educational partnerships that we are currently engaged in, whether it be with Durham, Fleming and or Loyalist. And finally, to continue to increase Northumberland's domestic and international profile through strategic marketing and promotion and strategic partnerships. So the recommendations that you'll find in the plan, in the integrated plan, speak to, a, to these, these six items. Um, enhanced shared services, <coughs> um, partnership development, the creation of or the investment in a business hub framework so that more and more we can uh, rely on a type of incubation accelerator model that supports ongoing, o ongoing activity and most importantly is, is probably one of uh, the best ways to engage and retain youth to branding and just a just a quick comment on 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 branding the concept here about branding is 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 to align economic development and community goals which support quality of service and result in branding being synonymous with quality branding in our mind is not about the logo it's the quality of service that goes with the activities that take place within economic development so in other words, Northumberland becomes the best place to do business. Because if it's the best place to do business, it will attract more business. Innovation driven, it's very, very difficult to determine exactly what innovation is uh, or give a specific uh, uh, name to it. Most people uh, um, uh, equate innovation with uh, software and, 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 and technology alone. Um, most of the work that's been done in eastern Ontario to try and provide a, an overall look at what innovation really means. It also means innovative practices. It means um, looking very, very hard at agri-food, which is probably one of the largest innovators within the province, and all, all the opportunities that are associated with that with respect to both the physical assets we currently have and what a huge part of um, the economic base it, 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 it uh, constitutes. And finally, clarity of message. Uh, it, it's Im important that um, uh, we constantly inform and engage our stakeholders so that they understand what we're doing as opposed to trying to guess what we might be doing and that this message resonates with the other uh, components of the plan as a whole. And finally, um, um, you'll find in the, the latter part of, of the, uh, the, the action, the integrated master plan, um, and I apologize because it's th this needs to be a pullout more than it needs to be a, a PowerPoint slide. What we've uh, done here is we've used the eight success criteria items that were that were that opened this presentation, beginning with a focused and robust entrepreneurship and going all the way down to serendipity, and put them in a matrix with the six portfolios. And within each one of those portfolios, if we look at agriculture and food as an example. You know, when we talk about focused and robust entrepreneurship, our, our, the role of the agriculture and food comp portfolio is to increase awareness of local agriculture jobs and agri-food entrepreneurship, to demonstrate the socio-economic impact of agriculture, assist in the creation of new ag policies and research, etc., etc., etc. And so what we've tried to do is create a cross, uh, a cross uh, linkage between success criteria and every, and every portfolio within economic development. And it's interesting, those, those um, um, items within each and every portfolio is the result of those uh, community consultations and the research that's been done. It's not an arbitrary selection point based on the individual managers and or the, uh, the, the department as a whole, but rather those are the inputs we, we received from the public consultations we took part in. So in all, what this, what this uh, action plan is, is, 
is it, it, what the integrated master plan is is based on is to create sort of is to create a framework by which over the long run we have some direction and focus for for economic development and also encourage the type of cooperative and collaborative effort that will drive economic renewal within within the county so that's the that's the that's the lofty vision of this uh, from this will come business plans and specific action plans um, as, as, as you can see it's it's uh, if, uh, from a content perspective within the within the plan itself there's ex uh, an exceptional amount of detail with each and every department or each and every portfolio rather that speaks to the, uh, the activities that they are currently engaged in the ones that they hope to be engaged in and how they will shape that so I'd, I'd, I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to give you an overview of this and I'd be more than happy to address any questions you might have I'll get the lights. Okay, Dan, thank you. Um, so, you know, we've heard tonight that uh, there's master plans for transportation, uh, master plans for long-term waste management, uh, master plans for the forest, and I think it's one of the appropriate that um, we have a, a master plan for economic development and tourism, which I think, as I said, there's a lot of interest in that. So. It's important that people understand that there is a focus and a purpose to, to what they're doing at the county. Uh, so I appreciate you sharing that with us, and I'm going to open it up to members of council who may have some questions. And I'm going to start with uh, councillors again. Dan, I'm really happy to hear that the uh, Business Advisory Center has, uh, you say, 1,700 inquiries and 400 consultations. That's super news. Um, in your research, how much does small business really is a factor for generating not only new businesses but new job creation? You mentioned innovation sometimes results in uh, productivity, less jobs, but is, bus is small business still the biggest or as big a driver as they used to be for, um, especially a place like Northumberland? It, it's certainly the, the driver for new growth at this point in time. I mean, we're not without uh, manufacturing inquiry and, and, and uh, processes that are in place or inquiries that are in place that are going to the next stage. But from that type of uh, um, um, activity within the Business Advisory Center and the end result in consultation and the amount of support individuals receive by, by coming through the center, uh, it's, it's significant. Food entrepreneurship is a, a food entrepreneurs are, are probably a really good example. Um, we're we're into uh, middle of February, and we've got uh, we've got probably half a dozen food entrepreneurs who are in, in you know product not only product development but product production. Uh, uh, one of them just uh, 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 came to us whose whose whole uh, whose whole basis for their business is hot sauces. Uh, he's got some creative names, and his uh, his uh, hot sauces just took. Uh, 14 awards at a, at a national food show in New York City, of which 10 were first place uh, finishes. So, I, I mean, um, it's amazing what support does to drive that entrepreneurial effort and what that means to those small entrepreneurs. It means the creation of one job or 1.5 jobs in the first year and maybe a doubling of that by year two. And those, those are the kind of st statistics that we're, we're, we're trying to roll up at this point in time in terms of giving community some sense of how large an investment that is and what a great return it is. Great, thank you. And, and just for the benefit of Council as well, the, f uh, the Business Advisory Center is funded through the province, so it is not, it, it's not a levy-dependent uh, uh, entity. Uh, what's, uh, what it does is we, we provide some of the, uh, some of the basic uh, uh, infrastructure for location and support. But uh, the province has been very, very generous, and in, in point of fact, uh, the, the the province has has, has uh, tagged uh, Business Advisory Center of Northumberland as being one of the more progressive um, uh, ones in in the, in the province, which has resulted in some considerable additional funding to provide um, some granting opportunities for new business startups that gets them off off the ground. So it's a it's a real tribute to the to the team that makes that that uh, the portfolio work. Councilor McCarthy. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I found this really um, imp an important document because what I'm seeing and, and, and I've watched now that I've been in this community 10 years 
and uh, the last two on council is it's strategic, it's focused, and it also requires a certain discipline. Because I am sure that a lot of people come to you and say, well, wait a minute, you should be funding this, you should be funding that. And I guess the other point I want to make is, although I speak a lot at the table about seniors, in fact, that demographic's going to move through. And what I see here is developing the groundwork for families to move here and create economic um, sustainability, which is actually what's going to help with North Armaland. So, in fact, you have to look 10, 15 years down the road and not focus on who's here now but who you're getting ready for. So I really like what I see, and I'm going to ask for a printed copy from sure. somebody <laughs> to read the matrix more carefully. Certainly. It's, avail it's, it's, it's available online, and one, once again, just to try and get some sense of it to, to, uh, to uh, the, the council, um, we've, we've done it in, 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 this, in this fashion. And I, I appreciate the comment about being, uh, being strategic. We, um, there isn't anything that we do that is not linked to one of the portfolio. There's a, a common theme through everything. And so whether it's with our educational partners or, or partner-like organizations or manufacturing and, and, and industry associations, we do it because it's, it's, it's not just for the immediate uh, return. It's for the, the, the building of relationships that exist over, 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 over time. So um, um, uh, certainly from, from the department's perspective, we certainly appreciate the uh, support we receive at, 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 at the municipal level to, uh, to uh, continue what we're, we're, what we're about to do. Um, you know, last, last week uh, was Minister's Day, whether it was uh, uh, Glenn Murray talking about the opportunities associated with green, and there are a number of green opportunities that we fall into under some of our current innovation initiatives to uh, a meeting with, uh, uh, with a select group of, of mayors Wednesday morning in, in Toronto with Minister Laura, Laura Albanese, who's the Minister of Immigration and, 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 or Citizenship and Immigration for the province, because Northumberland's been recognized as one of those, those counties who, um, in, its, in a rural, rural context, one in, one in ten uh, uh, Northumberland residents are first generation. And the work that's been done since, since late 2012 to build up uh, uh, an interest from uh, new Canadians in coming to Northumberland. Um, uh, ab about 20% of our clients at the, the Venture Centre are, are new Canadians, some of them Toronto-based, uh, because they seek opportunities with, with, with what we have to push their product back into the city. So it's, it's, um, n none of this is standalone, so it's, it's all strategic. Okay. Uh, did, are there other questions for Dan? Okay. Well, again, again, thank you, uh, thank you very much for You're the welcome. presentation. Very, very yeah, informative. Well. And uh, as a matter of fact, I do have a, a, the, the full copy of the uh, master plan. And for uh, what I'll do is I'll circulate it to all members of council. That way, you won't have to go onto the website and look for it. But uh, it is very, very comprehensive. You'll find it's very, very comprehensive and detailed. And uh, Dan just gave you a quick overview of, of the content that's in it. Thank you very much. Happy okay, thank you. Your Worship, the next item is under the heading of General Government Services. It's a memo from myself regarding the annual repayment limit for the Town of Coburg. Okay, I'm going to pass the, uh, the General Government Chair over to uh, Councillor Darling in the ab absence of uh, Deputy Mayor Henderson. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. At this time, the uh, action recommended that Council receive the report for information purposes. And uh, the county just mentioned there about their ARL. And uh, I wondered if uh, Mr. David would give a brief overview of ours at this time. Sure, sure thing. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. David would be happy to. He's got it all in this report. Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Darling. Um, the the um, couple things that I would like to point out on the uh, 2017 annual repayment limit is if uh, you refer to the uh, second page which is headed uh, determination of the annual debt repayment limit you'll see at the top of that page uh, and again keeping in mind these are our 2015 numbers but you'll see that the expenditures on total debt charges in 2015 was three million one forty four eight twenty eight and you'll note that of that 2.8 million or almost 90% of that figure was uh, repaying principal 
and uh, just slightly over 10% or 334,000 was the interest component. So um, again, I think that's a pretty favorable uh, ratio anytime you're uh, repaying almost 90% of your payments are going to knocking off uh, principal off your debt. The bottom half of that page uh, basically just runs through our total revenue in terms of getting down to what they call net revenue of 43 million and the, uh, the rate of 25% of that has been established as a reasonable amount to be using towards uh, paying debt uh, in the provinces. Uh, eyes, I guess, is uh, where that comes from. And so that leaves you with an estimated annual repayment limit of $7.8 million, um, which it should be pointed out is in addition uh, to the $3.1 million at the top of the page. Um, so basically that amount of money on the first page of the report shows uh, they've provided illustrations that you could, in effect, uh, with a 5% interest rate and a 20-year amortization, you could borrow uh, 97 million dollars and still be within their annual repayment limit. So again as uh, was pointed out by the county treasurer we're well within our uh, borrowing uh, capacity. Um, and again the main purpose of this uh, annual repayment limit is if we were to ever uh, exceed or approach the level of exceeding that limit um, we would have to go to the province for permission to issue additional debt. So. It's really just a safety measure to make sure that uh, uh, municipalities don't go too far into debt. Thank you, Mr. Davey. Any questions? Councillor McCarthy. Uh, thank you, um, Councillor uh, Darling. So I read in the press about um, Port Hope aiming for a 10% to be 10% of their ARL. And it, I really don't know how that pans out in terms of what we spend on debt, what we'd be allowed to spend um, based on the 25% uh, the, the amount. Um, so I was just wondering, how would that kind of calculation be made? And is that, is that a, a standard or a best practice to aim for for a municipality? Mr. Davey? Uh, I really can't answer as to what would be a best practice as far as the percentage of the annual repayment limit. Um, I guess that's something we'd have to research. I think it was, if you don't mind me follow up, in view of what the um, of Glenn from the county was saying that if you actually are borrowing close to your limit, you're, it's indicative of you're not in the best shape. So. Uh, I guess I, I, well, maybe that's the answer. It's unique to each municipality and you have to figure out the parameters or is that 10% number appropriate and how is that calculated? But I understand, you're not, yeah. I okay. <laughs> Mayor Brocken here. If I may, uh, Councillor Darling, I think if you if you take a look at your the way you budget your own home and your own you know, finances, uh, the, 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 the best scenario is to have no debt. So there are no payments. And I don't think the municipalities are any different. It's just that uh, we very few municipalities get to that point. Councillor McCarthy. Well, and I appreciate the mayor's comment because one of the reasons that I understand we go into debt is, is not because there's no other way to fund this, but in fact it's to be, pay, be fair to the taxpayer. Because if we ask... The, the, the levy, the current populace to pay for Golden Plow right out through the levy and use our reserves. We're actually asking the current population to pay for the project right out when in fact when we do some of it through debt we're asking the future population to ha help pay for that asset. So in fact I think debt is a fair way to raise funds for projects than, than the way we all like to live, which is no debt. So I'm, I am comfortable with debt, even though our mantra is no debt. It's, it's a fair practice. I would agree. Mayor Brocken here. Uh, yeah, Councillor Darling. So again, to uh, Councillor McCarthy. So there, there are some areas where it, it, it is wise to uh, have debt uh, so that you do spread the payments out. When I think of our, you know, uh, we, 
our, when we borrow money for our uh, uh, wastewater capital projects or for water projects, then it's only fair that we spread the payments out over a period of time so that it's not paid for all up front by the people who are using the services today, but make sure that people who will be using the services in the future will pay, some, pay off some of that. So, so you're exactly right that um, in, in the broader scheme of things for municipalities, there are times when it, in fairness to the taxpayer, you do, you do take on debt. Any other questions? Uh, Councillor Sagan. Thank you, Councillor uh, Darling. Uh, through you, Mr. Davey, um, the illustration purposes here uh, on the interest rates, I know that various infrastructure projects come in at a, a different interest rate. That five to seven, is that kind of an average that the town pays? Uh, yes, uh, to Councillor Sagan, the, um, as long as I have seen the annual repayment limit, the illustrative uh, <laughs> description from the province has been five and seven percent. For some years now, mm -hmm. probably at least the last ten, we've been borrowing at much less than the five percent. So if you were to if you were to change that five percent number to uh, three percent, for instance, obviously the annual repayment, the amount of debt you could borrow would go even higher. So um, yeah, it's just, they've never changed that formula. It's been five to seven percent. Thank you. Any other questions, concerns? Okay, all in favor? Carried. The next item on the agenda is uh, the memo from Adam Giddings, Manager of Regulatory Compliance and Finance Lakefront Utilities regarding the proposed 2017 water services uh, capital and operating budgets. And yes, the action here recommended that council approve the 2017 water services capital in operating budgets. And at this time, we'll have Mr. Giddings give us a brief explanation. Sure. Uh, I trust everyone had an opportunity to read the memo. Um, I'll go over it quickly. It may be sort of starting starting at the bottom and what we're totally or what we're approving for total operating costs is uh, two million five hundred ninety eight thousand which represents about a 2% increase um, from 2016 budget. Um, further, to that, further to that, our 2016 actual costs, are the 2017 budget represents about a 1.85% increase from our 2016 actual. Um, also, uh, if Council remembers, the 2017 budgeted operating cost figures agrees to what we incorporated in our water rate study that we presented to Council in December 2015. It also agrees to the financial plan that we had presented to Council in January 2016, so all those figures agree. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer um, any, anything. Any questions from Council at this time? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Carried. And the third item under general government Thank you, is Mr. Giddings. Sorry. Sorry. The third item under general government is a letter from Autism Ontario regarding proclamation of World Autism Awareness Day on April 3rd, 2017. Uh, yes, the recommendation here is that Council proclaim April 3rd, 2017 as World Autism Awareness Day in the town of Coburg. Any discussion? I think it's pretty straightforward. All in favor? Carried. Okay, Councillor Darning, you keep the chair. You're now, now it's under Parks and Recreation Services. And the first item is a memo from the Secretary of Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee regarding the naming of the new Amherst Linear Park. Uh, yes, the action here that Council received the motion from the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee and respectfully denied the request from New Amherst Limited to name the Linear Park Willow Park and further that the town review the park's naming policy through the public consultation and develop a list of potential names for future town of Coburg Parks. Any discussion? Councillor Rowden? Yes, uh, Councillor Doring, just a quick question on this, uh, on a request by uh, New Amherst. Uh, do we not take some of the recommendations from some of the developers in the past from um, the naming of parks because of uh, the history on them? I know they try to do that with the streets, and I'm wondering, is, a, is a parks a separate policy? Um, to my knowledge, there is a separate policy, and yes, we have in the past, based on history, um, 
the discussion at Parks and Rec that this uh, this was the developer who wanted to name it after his grandfather or pardon me granddaughter and uh, Parks and Rec felt that there it was uh, maybe a lot more appropriate names out there f to do with the history of our town or geographical in nature and that's why at that time we had recommended um, that we the uh, Parks and Rec had recommended um, reviewing the policy to make sure that everything was in place. Now at this time, if I could, I'd ask uh, Director Hoskwick if he had anything further to add. Just turn it off. The, uh, the discussion at the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee uh, um, was also taking into consideration practices uh, regarding street names and uh, as the chair mentioned uh, the belief that uh, there's a lot of history in the community a lot of individuals throughout the history of the community that uh, might be better uh, recognized through whether it's uh, street names that uh, public works handles or uh, parks um, rather than simply taking uh, recommendations specifically from uh, developers so, uh, so from a staff perspective uh, we support uh, the recommendation and would be happy to uh, provide uh, further advice after reviewing the uh, the policy if that's uh, the committee's wish okay. thank you mr. Hustrick any other questions or concerns all in favor carried okay councillor Rob uh, public uh, works yes your worship thank you uh, uh, we have a letter from Den uh, Denise and uh, Le Dennis and Lindy Linda Guindon uh, regarding the request for an installation of an accessible parking space in front of 480 Burnett Drive in Coburg and the action recommended that council refer this matter to staff for a further report I did go up there today and there's a lot of snow around and of course parking on Burnett Drive is pretty limited and I'm just wondering that uh, with with the recommendation that uh, that staff would not look at this in case there's other people do requests for that same thing because we're going to have not only put signs up but mark the road as well and it's pretty congested in that area. Any questions? Uh, all in favor? Carried. Okay, uh, Councillor Burkett, we're over. The first, well, there, there was a, an item under um, protection services on accessibility, but I believe the um, the uh, action has been deferred to allow the new members of the accessibility committee to have comment on it before it comes back to council. So we're now into planning and development services. Councillor Burkett, you have the chair. Okay, we have a memo from the uh, planning development planner one. Heritage regarding the downtown Coburg vitalization community improvement plan implementation plan the action recommended that council receive the report for information purposes and further that council endorse the implementation of the downtown Coburg vitalization community improvement plan CIP as outlined in the staff report and I would just ask uh, that director McGlashan uh, speak to this Thank you, uh, Councillor Burkett. Um, uh, as you uh, see in your agenda, um, Allison Tory LaPere, our heritage planner, has prepared a, a detailed report on the uh, implementation plan that we're proposing for um, the 2017 version of uh, the Coburg Downtown Vitalization uh, Community Improvement Plan. Uh, as you know, the uh, CIP was uh, adopted by Council almost one year ago uh, under Section 28 of the Planning Act. And uh, it is, of course, just briefly to provide uh, incentives um, for uh, private uh, development to um, rehabilitate, um, enhance, and restore, and also encourage redevelopment uh, within the downtown uh, core of, uh, of Coburg. There are a number of programs under uh, the CIP that uh, help uh, provide for uh, grants and loans for redevelopment projects and rehabilitation and uh, each of these programs can be used they can be stacked and um, uh, used for um, a variety of purposes 
uh, last year, it's the first year of rollout, we approved five uh, projects ranging from facade, minor fa facade restoration and roofing uh, proposals to um, major uh, facade re restorations and also a residential infill uh, project. The um, total uh, number of uh, grants and loans equaled uh, approximately fifty fifty-five thousand dollars uh, each and um, we feel it's very uh, successful in moving forward. Um, just in the last several months a uh, subcommittee of the um, downtown coalition was formed to uh, help uh, create a an implementation plan for the CIP moving forward and um, this subcommittee and staff um, uh, looked at a number of uh, issues particularly in terms of uh, the action plan moving forward are four key areas uh, first of all of course um, initiating the uh, CIP through a selection process or a consultant uh, or sorry a project selection criteria evaluation um, also an application intake and approval uh, system marketing and communication uh, program as well as a reporting and monitoring uh, component to the uh, to the plan um, and Allison actually is here I think what I'll do is ask Allison to uh, maybe come forward and just explain a little bit about the actual um, implementation plan before we uh, conclude Hi, Allison. Uh, thank you Glenn um, through you mr. mayor um, we have uh, as Glenn mentioned um, had a site or a subcommittee of the downtown coalition and some staff members as well uh, work together to develop a comprehensive set of criteria and a procedure for evaluating and um, prioritizing the projects that we are um, expecting to receive applications for uh, in the coming year and that work was done in anticipation of the continuation of this uh, community improvement plan the uh, criteria are outlined in the report. Uh, we have also weighted them um, in a way that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we felt reflected the prioritization of the various goals and uh, objectives of the downtown vitalization initiatives. Um, the most highly weighted uh, criteria include the leverage of uh, private funds. So that's the grant or loan cost leverage and that's um, basically awarding a higher score to projects that leverage more private funds at a lower cost to the town. Um, also visual impact was weighted highly and we have some bonus points in that category. Uh, that's in recognition of the public input that was received through the development of the Downtown Vitalization Action Plan uh, that very strongly indicated uh, a desire from the public to see improvements to the exterior of buildings that are visible from the public realm uh, in downtown Coburg. The uh, next um, weighted, I guess you could say, the next uh, most significant uh, criterion is the impact on target business attraction. And again, in 2013, through the Downtown Vitalization Action Plan, uh, there was a survey done that identified several target businesses that we would like to see in the downtown area. So we've awarded um, a higher weight to projects that include those types of uses uh, coming to the downtown. Um, next is the historical preservation impact, which uh, evaluates the um, scope of work, the significance on the heritage conservation where the building is in fact a designated heritage building. Um, within the CIP study area, um, there is quite, I would say, definitely a majority of the buildings are designated. Um, however, not all of them are. So that's a criteria that um, takes that into account. After that, we've looked at um, two equally weighted categories. One is for uh, residential square footage and one is business square footage. And um, this criteria um, gives a score based on the percentage of the total gross floor area of the building that is either residential space or business space being uh, rehabilitated, converted, upgraded, or created. And we also have bonus points available there for new units that aren't already um, in existence. And then finally, we also have a criterion um, that looks at the structural integrity impact of a scope of work. And the intention there is to recognize that there is often significant work required to buildings that may not actually be all that visible. It might be more of a, a structural integrity issue that's being addressed. 
Um, so that's the final criterion. Uh, we did develop several hypothetical applications that um, rain, took the whole range of potential um, eligible projects that we may receive applications for, and we ran them through uh, a very detailed formula um, and scored them all and um, the subcommittee was satisfied that the procedure that we've come up with has um, given us a, a way to appropriately prioritize uh, the projects that will then align best with the, uh, the goals of the downtown vitalization initiatives. Um, also included in this implementation plan is um, our intention to uh, or I guess our timeline for how we're going to actually implement this in the coming year. We're proposing two intake dates in the calendar year, one in the spring and one in the fall. And we've arrived at those dates by looking at the timelines for um, reviewing the applications, scoring them as a subcommittee and at staff level, and then being able to bring a recommendation forward to Committee of the Whole and ultimately to Council for a final decision regarding the allocation of funds um, at points in the year that we felt were most suitable based on when we received applications this year. Um, so before the Victoria Day holiday in, in May and then again before Labor Day, we found that in the downtown core, many of the building owners and business owners were hesitant to undertake very big facade improvements in the middle of the summer when there's often special events and so forth. So we felt this gave two opportunities during the year that would still also allow for funds to be allocated um, well in advance of the budget deliberations for the coming year. Um, and that brings me to my next point, which is um, the monitoring and reporting. We've separated reporting and monitoring. Um, we've had extensive discussions about this at the downtown coalition meetings. Um, our intention is to monitor the program annually, of course, a report to council annually on the uptake of the program, uh, how many applications we're receiving, what the status of those projects is. Obviously, the ones earlier in the year may have an opportunity to be farther along than the ones allocated in the second intake. But um, we intend to be able to report to council annually um, how the criteria are being met. So how many new units have we created? What is the total square footage, the value of these projects, the amount of private funds that is actually being leveraged in the downtown? So um, separate to that, the CIP itself actually includes um, recommended program durations and some of the more um, comprehensive elements of the CIP. It's a 10-year recommended duration and some of them are five years. So. Um, we are proposing to be evaluating uh, more comprehensively the overall performance of the CIP on a five-year basis. Um, that also allows for the momentum of these projects to really take hold and have an impact on the downtown. So there'll be two elements, the annual reporting and a more comprehensive um, program evaluation on a, a longer time scale. Um, and then the final thing I'll speak to quickly is, um, of course, we also have a, a plan for marketing and communicating the program. We uh, want to be able to reach as many of the potential applicants as possible prior to the intake deadlines. Um, we had great uptake this year consider in 2016, considering that we didn't have um, much significant marketing, um, that we were really doing it on a trial basis um, with a smaller amount of, of funds than we do have available in the budget for 2017. Um, however, we'd like to ensure that we, um, we reach as many people as possible to get the best applications as possible. Um, and we also not just want to communicate to applicants, but we'd like to market it to them as an opportunity to become actively involved in the momentum of downtown vitalization, which we've heard from some of the business owners downtown they really feel is taking hold. So um, we're proposing, uh, I've, the communications officer as well has uh, been involved in the development of a multifaceted communication plan, including municipal ads, uh, website ads. Um, also, we're intending to do a mail out directly to the properties within the study area and reach out to the DBIA and have um, some application packages available for people interested as well. Um, as with most comprehensive applications that come to the planning department, we of course have pre-consultation that usually takes place beforehand, so um, we're hoping to be able to reach as many people as possible and really draw in the best applications this year in 2017. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about that.
Thank you, Allison. Are there any questions from Council? Uh, <laughs> Councillor McCarthy? Yes, thank you, Councillor Burkett. Well, you've made our job a lot easier. Uh, I, I am really pleased with this uh, compared to last year where we're kind of operating without that sense of criterion. My only question is, we have put 100000 in the budget this year. Would you be d keeping 50 for the first intake or 50 for later or just, let's put it this way, in the first intake, cap it at 50 if all the asks are at that? What, how, how will that be managed? Mm -hmm. We haven't, um, we don't have a definite approach to that. It's definitely something we've discussed. Um, our, I don't want to say our gut feeling, but our impression is that we don't necessarily feel it's appropriate to hold back on funds if we get very significant high scoring projects at the first intake. So we're not at the outset saying that we're going to um, only have half the pool available at the start of the year and half at the second of the year because we'd like to reserve that decision for or that recommendation to you um, based on the applications we actually receive. Uh, it also doesn't preclude people from applying at the second intake. So if they've applied at the first intake and not received the funding they applied for, if they choose to wait and apply at the second intake, then we would score them again um, at that point too. And any allocation of funds is actually, of course, our recommendation will come forward to council, but the final decision would of course be at this level from council. Councillor Darling. Thank you, Councillor Burkett. Um, one, just a clar clarification, we did pass 150,000 this year rather than 100. Yeah, okay, just wanted to make sure that I had my numbers correct there. Uh, last year we, we had uh, five recipients. Did we have more than five applications and turn them down or did we just have the five? We just had the five. Okay, that's um, fine. We had a couple of them who knew that this was sort of likely coming down the pipes so they waited a little bit um, they had their heritage permits in place and they were ready to go as soon as the the funds were available um, we uh, with that five we had 50,000 in the budget and we did go slightly over that so we sort of evaluated them as they were received okay now with uh, the two periods that you can apply if we do give up all the money in the first period, which I hope we do, <laughs> and uh, we get applications in the second period, would they be pushed into next year, or could they be accepted on the basis that there's funding next year? Mm -hmm. um, that's likely a decision that will be above my head <laughs> 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 and up to you folks. Um, I, uh, I, again, I agree with you. I hope very much that we get projects early in the year that uh, score very highly and that we, as staff um, can bring confidently bring forward a recommendation regarding the allocation of the funds to support those projects. Um, I, uh, I don't really know how that's going to go. We're also, this is our, our first year really implementing it. Um, the CIP itself includes uh, monitoring variables that we're also looking at and it does also suggest um, feedback from the applicants. So that's something we intend to collect too is do these intake dates work for you? We don't want to be holding back people from starting work that they'd like to be doing because they have to wait four months or whatever for a decision on funding. So um, we're learning as well as we go. Um, we're pretty confident that the plan we're bringing forward puts us in a good position. Um, but again, I expect that when we report at the end of the year, we'll have learned a few things and, and may tweak a few things as well. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, Councillor uh, Darling, um, similar to 2016, um, if we were to reach the maximum budget allocation in that first intake, um, similar to 2016, we would first come to council and um, and either uh, present a proposal to council to increase that budget or you know hold it at the at the line. So it would be certainly council's prerogative to move forward if, at that point. Yeah, I would just hate to see that uh, we have more applications come forward and you know we we can't deal with them. But uh, hopefully that'll be a good sign. Thank well, you. And likely at our first intake date, if our recommendation is to allocate all the funds, we'll know well in advance if we're going to have anything for the second intake. So we can have that conversation early on. Are there any other questions? Councillor Sagan. I just wanted to uh, thank Allison for all your hard work on this because just just coming up with the weighting criteria and really listening to what people put into uh, 
Well, what businesses we need here and, and visual impact and, and how much it'll strengthen the downtown. I think it's an excellent uh, uh, program and I think it's obviously council supported your uh, department by giving you 150,000. So keep it wise and, and keep up the, uh, the good work. And, and we look forward to the monitoring and the follow up because it is, it is money that uh, it's really not ours to spend, it's the taxpayers, and we really hope that it will improve the downtown. But again, thank you for all your work. I know you've worked really hard and long hours at this, and it really works. I see this possibly as a model for other communities to follow down the road. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions from council? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. I have a memo from the Secretary of the Coburg Heritage Advisory Committee regarding a heritage permit application for a single story 10 unit addition on the north rear of the existing building located at 100 University Avenue East, Victoria Retirement Residence. Action recommended that Council endorse the comments from the Coburg Heritage Advisory Committee and grant the per Heritage Permit Number HP-2017-003 for the property located at 100 University Avenue East, Coburg, Victoria Retirement Residence for a 10-unit residential addition located at the rear or north rear of the existing building subject to finalization of details and conditions by staff. Any questions in regard on this? This isn't a question, just a, just a comment. Uh, in regards to this and what we heard earlier tonight, this is a good news story. I would say that one of our retirement residents are expanding, but it's also the economic spin-off that will be with that will be fairly uh, significant, I would think. So it's a good news story, I think. Are there any other questions from councillors? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, uh, Councillor Sagan, you get your first opportunity to take the chair at uh, Committee of the Whole. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have a letter from Ron Weeb, uh, Downtown Coburg and Lions uh, Club Santa Claus Parade Committee Chair, regarding the disbanding of the Santa Claus Parade uh, Committee. A sad story. Obviously, uh, the action is that the letter be referred to staff for further report. Uh, any discussion? Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, in his letter, he does mention that it does cost about $10,000 to put this parade on. In the last few years, 3500 has come from the Coburg uh, Downtown BIA and 3200 from the Coburg Lions Club. It is a tremendous amount of work. Um, I know the community that I'm from, Prescott, the fire department put it on every year. And it, it's about that much, 10000 every year, to, uh, to pay for the bands primarily that come in at, at Christmas time. So um, I'd look, ask anyone around council what they feel about this. It's, it's a tremendous uh, financial impact, especially after the budget's been passed, to come to council. He'd like uh, council or the town of Coburg to carry this on. So any comments from anyone? Councilor McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sagan. So uh, I will be interested in a, a report from Council, but I'd, I'd like to have it considered to a uh, timeline be attached to it, because um, if uh, there needs to be some community engagement uh, and partnership established, uh, having run the um, uh, DBIA and worked front lines on uh, Santa Claus Parade, was the year we won the... Uh, Civic Award, the Lions Club for the parade, because mm -hmm. it is a huge and beloved event. Anyways, they, the, there's a lot of things that have to start well in advance. Um, booking the bands is the big one. Um, so is it possible through you to, um, perhaps the director, Hustwick, to give a sense of when a report could come back to council, and the sooner the better? Anything, uh, Director Hustwick? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think uh, we could probably in a week prepare some options, but uh, I think uh, what we would likely bring forward is recommendations to engage 
the community and look for options in terms of how and which groups and which individuals might be able to contribute to this. One thing that we're planning to do uh, at a staff level is to review all of the uh, events uh, that uh, occur in the community uh, on a regular basis and uh, um, provide some recommendations to Council at some point uh, this year on uh, what the municipal role should be on those types of, of uh, events and, uh, and the level of our contribution because we, we really have one staff member that uh, contributes uh, enormous resources and time to many, many different events. So um, the capacity of the organization is really getting stretched. So. Um, know we can work fairly quickly to outline some options but I think in terms of finding a, a, a solution it's going to take some time and and lots of discussions and and that's certainly something we could do um, at a staff level is, is engage in some of those discussions and and then maybe bring forward more definitive recommendations um, um, so that would take a little bit longer so I, it's really up to council on how quickly you would want us to bring forward and how comprehensive the recommendations would be any other questions, Mayor? Uh, yeah, Chair again. Uh, so, as far as the uh, three thousand five hundred dollars goes, that's that's the least of our concerns. You know, we have drawn from contingency, contingency funds in the past for you know for for important projects. I I think the uh, the important question is, you know, uh, when we have to make a decision as soon as possible to determine what our involvement would be, as uh, Mr. Hustwick had said, uh, so that they can proceed to start. With the planning, contacting bands, and all the all the participants that they have to book months in advance, so that's the that's the important step. Anyone else? Okay, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Carried. Second item is a memo from the events coordinator regarding the municipal event application for a 55 plus winter games. Middle Night Mingle in downtown Coburg. Again, uh, Director Huswick, if you could uh, let us know a little bit what we're uh, going to be seeing at Middle Night Mingle. I guess there's a road closure involved as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is uh, Middle Night because it's, it's uh, the second evening of uh, the 55 plus games. The intention is to create a, uh, a community event in the downtown area and, and engage local businesses uh, as well, uh, and in particular. Um, so we have 800 plus participants uh, um, that are coming into the community as part of these games, a tremendous uh, opportunity to showcase the community. So the intention is to get as many of them into the downtown uh, core as possible, but also it's a community event where we're, we're inviting m the residents and members of the public to, to join in the festivities. So we, we're working with local restaurants um, and other establishments to uh, open the doors and uh, um, host live entertainment and give an opportunity for uh, the participants and locals to go uh, from facility to facility, enjoy the evening. We're also uh, actively working on outdoor activities. There's uh, a wonderful concert that is uh, booked and uh, we're fine tuning the, the details in the concert hall in, in this building. Um, we're trying to create a, a wonderful community outdoor indoor event uh, to bring both the residents and the participants together. So. Uh, there's still more details that we're actively working on, but uh, hopefully there's lots of people watching tonight, and stay tuned. So it's February 22nd, and uh, it'll be um, a great opportunity to come downtown, uh, get the DBIA and local businesses involved, and uh, showcase what the community has. Thank you, Director. So the action recommended is that Council approve the road closure of King Street uh, from Division Street to George Street on Wednesday, February 22nd, 2017 between 5.30 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. for the 55 plus Winter Games Middle Night Mingle event. Any questions? I get all the hard ones. <laughs> all in favor? Carried. Your Worship, the items of unfinished business are listed in the agenda. 
and there is a closed session this evening. Okay, uh, just before I call for adjournment, I do have one item to bring up, and, and that relates to the council meet, the regular council meeting next uh, Tuesday. Monday is uh, Family Day. Uh, we know that we have the opening for the 55-plus uh, games happening at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, next Tuesday. Uh, we have the Lieutenant Governor visiting in the afternoon for a roundtable discussion and then a, a bit of a social afterwards. So um, I guess my question to council is, uh, if you would prefer to be at the opening, then we will delay the council meeting until 8 o'clock. If you would sooner start the meeting at 7 o'clock, I'll attend the opening and uh, the deputy mayor will start the, the council meeting until I show up. So what's the preference of council? Would you, do you want to attend the opening ceremonies or do you want to? Okay, so the consensus is yes. So Carrie, all right, then uh, I'll talk to um, Kara about getting the... Uh, the, the press release out that the council meeting next Tuesday will start at 8 p.m. Mr. Uh, Mr. Husband. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, uh, the opening ceremonies, I believe, begins at 7.30 and are scheduled to uh, to go till about 9 o'clock, I believe. <laughs> well, uh, if you could add a little um, more detail to that, maybe, may, uh, you know, maybe we should be I don't know, maybe we should be doing whatever we have to do in the first hour. Is, is that possible? Um, well, I, I, uh, absolutely. Um, I think uh, I'm not sure exactly when in the schedule your involvement is, but uh, I mean, I, I believe the rest of council would, uh, would certainly be free to, to leave and uh, okay. start council. Okay. Whatever time you choose. <laughs> <laughs> well, but well, I guess we can play it by ear. So, um, the, uh, the, if uh, if I'm required to stay longer, I will. But if not, the, uh, I'll be here with the. Uh, I'll be leaving at the same time as the rest of the council. And as speaking of uh, communications, uh, I'm sure Kara would like some input. Um, so there are a number of performances planned starting at seven o'clock. Uh, the actual speakers won't begin until 7.30, so it's likely going to carry into no earlier than 8.30 when you would be able to exit the stage and make your way back to council. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Councillor McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mayor Brockner. Is it possible to consider, because we're being flexible with the time, and I don't know other people's schedules, but could we have a 4 o'clock council meeting? Uh, no, we have okay. events uh, taking place prior to the... Pardon? We can move it to the next week? We can skip a week. Yeah. Yes. That would make that would make more sense. Uh, CAO Peacock. Uh, with the schedule having that one week uh, empty, anyways, it, it yes, was, it was, uh, should be no problem to schedule. On. Okay. All right. I think that's uh, that seems to be the consensus that uh, we will skip a council meeting next week and hold up the follow the regular uh, council meeting the following Monday, and then the Monday after that will be committee of the whole again. So just to keep everything in order. Okay. That, that seems to be the consensus of council, so I'm calling for an adjournment. Councillor Rod. <coughs> I forgot we have a closed session. Uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor Darn. Uh, yes, Your Worship. The action recommended that Council meet in closed sessions in accordance with Section 239 of the Municipal Act SO 2001 regarding personal matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees, and this one's to deal with a municipal ombudsman's report. Okay. All in favor? Carried. Now, adjournment. Uh, Councillor Rodden.